confess Christ our hope in life and death oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Good morning, folks. And thumbs up. It's time to get started here today. Um, I'm not sure what you do at the beginning of your services now, but I know I'm supposed to welcome everybody from near and far. Uh, glad to do that. And then um, also just to say a special shout out and thank you to Pastor Angel for the invitation to come back and the opportunity to share with you all today. It's good to be back here at St. Jacob's and outside in our pavilion. Although, Bill, we spent a lot of money fixing the air conditioner and it is hot out here. I wanted you to do something about that. I thought you would have had that sorted out out here by now. <laughs> that would have been great. Anyway, good to be with everyone. Just as we get started, though, I um, would like to know if there's anybody that would like to share anything. I understand you have a sharing time and see what the Holy Spirit is doing amongst you. Dawn? The Holy Spirit has blessed me with five of my cousins visiting from Colorado, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, and Texas. One thing I see that's not different is that everybody still sits in the back. <laughs> Some things just don't change. Is there anything anyone else would like to share? Well, as Pastor Angel is away this week, Pastor Tina Krog is uh, covering pastoral care uh, for you all, and then you're invited to call the office and get a hold of Krista, who can help schedule all that if you need anything. With that in mind, then, let us begin or continue our worship today as we would, I don't know if you stand or not stand, but I say do whatever you feel like, and we sing Gather Us In from 532. Call your 
our sons and our daughters. Call us anew to be salt for the earth. Gather us to drink the wine of compassion. Give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place the new light is shining, now is the kingdom and now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever, gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together, fire love in our flesh and our bones. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the life in the world. Beloved people of God, in the name, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. There's always more than enough through Jesus, the bread of life. You are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into an abundant life. Amen.
Kyrie eleison every day. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger that we may live and grow in faith and hope through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 to 33. The steadfast love of of the Lord never ceases. The Lord's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in the Lord. The Lord is good to those who wait for the Lord. To the soul that seeks the Lord, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence. When the Lord has imposed it to put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults, for the Lord will not reject forever. Although the Lord causes grief, the Lord will have compassion. According to the abundance of the Lord's steadfast love, for the Lord does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. Please read responsibly by whole verse, Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks in holy remembrance. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with my Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, A great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came to him and saw him, fell at his feet, begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. A large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. She was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhages stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see a crowd pressing in on you, and how can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling. She fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. 
He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make such a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him and went out and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand, said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of old, old. At this time, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Do any of the kids want to come forward here today? we got lots of room because the big kids want to sit in the back. <laughs> They're going to say it was to make space for you. We'll go with that. You, wanna, you can sit there if you want. You don't have to stand or sit on the concrete. She likes you better, Elise. I mean, this is how it goes in life, right? You always get passed up one time or another. Somebody more favorable comes along. Well, good morning. Good to see you guys. Haven't seen you in a while. Well, I saw you guys the other day, but, you know, haven't seen you in a while. Doing okay? Yeah. All right. Well, I have a question for you this morning. Is there something in your life, can you think of something that was difficult for you to learn or took you a little bit of a time and many tries to do before you're able to do it right? Can you think of anything? Like what? Instrument. Your instrument. That's a good one. What else, Drake? Yeah, yeah. That takes a lot of time. I still am learning. Diving. Huh? Diving. Diving. Yeah, that takes a while. What about you? You're still learning so many things, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. I love life. Say what? I love life. Oh, she buys you stuff? Yeah. <laughs> that usually helps motivate us a little bit sometimes, too. <laughs> I see. So she's. <laughs> well, those are some good things, but there's also other things in our lives, maybe things you don't remember so well. Like, do you remember when you were learning to tie your shoes? I see it's all easy now. You got sandals on, except for Drake. I mean, how long did it take you? Maybe a week. Yeah, it took a while, and you probably got frustrated, and you kept doing it. What about um, what about riding a bike? You guys ride a bike? Well, Drake said I'm going to do it the next day he did it. Pretty determined. That's, that's unfair. <laughs> Can't be unfair. You just watched her and did it. No, no, no. I oh. Was like, And you did it. Yeah, sometimes it happened. What about walking? Do you remember when you learned to walk? No. I bet your parents do. I bet they remember. They probably regret it, too, some days. <laughs> yeah. But they, walking and talking, I bet you don't remember learning to talk either. But you had to keep doing it, and you did it. And eating, remember learning to eat with a fork and a spoon, anything like that? I mean, it took time. You don't remember all those things, but you kept at it. You were, you were persistent. You didn't give up on any of those things. I bet you don't give up on the video games, do you, Drake? When you're learning to play, you don't give up till you got it. In fact, your parents probably have to make you stop just so you won't keep doing it, right? Yeah, I know that, yeah. You don't give up or quit, and because you don't give up or quit, you can do all these things that you do today. And it's good that you do that. And today we read a story about Jesus who also doesn't quit. He doesn't give up. And, and there were a number of times when he could have quit, but he didn't. He always kept going. If you remember this story, there was a father who kept asking for Jesus to, to heal his daughter. It's not an easy thing to do, but Jesus agreed to help. 
And then helping this father proved kind of difficult because there's so many people around Jesus. They're all pushing in and pressing and trying to touch him and do all things. He could have quit right there and said it's too hard, but he didn't. And then there's this woman who touches him and reaches out and, and she's cured. And Jesus wants to know who touched him. And his disciples are like, are you kidding me? Like all these people around and you figured out that a person has touched you. Lots of people have touched you. Everyone's touching you. But Jesus doesn't give up on that. He keeps pressing a little bit further, asking them, but somebody touched me. Something's happened here. I know it. And finally, this woman steps forward. She says, it's me. And he tells her her faith has made her well. And while all this is happening, the father learns the news that his daughter has died. The people tell Jesus to give up, turn around, go back. No point bothering the teacher anymore. But Jesus doesn't listen to them. He doesn't give up. He continues on his way, eventually makes it back to, to the daughter, and he brings her back to life. And there's a reason Jesus doesn't give up. He keeps his focus on God, and because he keeps his focus on God, he doesn't give up. It's hard to keep focus sometimes, isn't it? Well, I want you to remember this story as a story of endurance. And I want you to remember the things that you've learned in your life that you didn't give up on. Because that's how you keep going. That's how you keep persisting. You keep going and you keep going and you don't give up. Because if you don't give up, you, you, you keep, you, you'll, you'll find your, what you're looking for eventually, right? You'll learn how to do those things. But it also goes to people. We can't give up on people either. We can't give up on loving people and caring for people. We can't give up on, on really searching to do what Jesus wants. So you already have good practice at not giving up. So keep going. Don't give up. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the many ways in which you have never given up on us and your promise never to give up on us. So help us as we go about our own work and our own lives and do our own things that we could be as persistent as you are, that we would not give up, that we would keep the faith, we keep working at things, and that we could be patient and enduring in love. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of this day and the opportunity we have to gather in this space, this beautiful world that you have created to enjoy the nature before us, the people around us, and your presence among us. We ask that you continue to still in our hearts every voice but your own. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, it is certainly good to be back with you all today, and as I've already said, I want to thank Pastor Angel for the invitation to come and share with you this morning. As I was sent the liturgy and looked at the gospel, what was today, and the readings, I got really excited because these are, this is Mark's gospel, first of all, and second, they're just, there's so much there, so many beautiful things and, and, and ways to, to talk about that. And the gospel that we've read this morning, it's, it's so full of interesting details and a, a plethora of interpretations. I will try to stay on course, though, this morning and focus on just a few of those things that have jumped out to me. But please, I encourage you to read and reread this lesson for this week and allow the Holy Spirit to just keep working in you and, and, and from the Word. What jumped out to me this week in our reading was something about taking notice and, and hope. Hope that is both revealed and enhanced and within and around us when we allow ourselves to be interrupted pausing long enough on our journey to take notice. Notice of situations and circumstance to take notice of others. Now, we all know about interruptions. I mean, how many of you like interruptions? <laughs> how many of you get frustrated by interruptions? I would like to see both hands in the air for that, I'm sure. Most of the time, we don't like them. We, we know how one little thing can derail a, a whole day or even worse, cause us to miss out on a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We try to minimize those disruptions. We make plans, we ignore things that maybe we shouldn't ignore, but all for good reason and cause, because we don't want to be interrupted. But sometimes, we have to be interrupted. Sometimes there are things so important, so significant, maybe we don't even know it, 
that we need to be interrupted, stopped in our tracks, stand still, pause for a moment, and be interrupted by life, by others, by circumstance. Now, coming through a pandemic, we know our lives have been interrupted. We're still trying to figure out normal and whatever that is. We've had one big interruption after another, life-changing interruptions. They're all around us. I wonder if instead of getting so frustrated with interruptions, if we couldn't learn a little bit more to embrace them, to see them as opportunities for mission, for ministry, opportunities for God to work, opportunities to take notice of God's work among us and within us. Now, in these scriptures, like you read all scripture, you have to pay attention to the context to the characters, the the action in the story, to to fully grasp what's happening here. This context begins by the sea, but it's not just any sea. It's the sea that Jesus had had crossed over again from the other side. (laughs) Scripture's pretty clear. He was on the other side. The other side of what? You fill in the blank. (laughs) We often find ourselves on the other side of where we really want to be or where we need to be or having come back from somewhere. But in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus does a lot of crossing over. Back from one side of the sea to the other side of the sea. And when He does, it is a sure thing that something is about to happen. That He is about to do some kind of boundary-breaking mission or ministry. It's Mark's way of saying to the reader, to the hearers, to us, pay attention. Don't miss out on what I'm about to tell you here. Don't miss out on about what's going to happen right here, right now, in this next scene. Wake up. Now, the characters in the story are also interesting. They're an interesting bunch, aren't they? There's Jesus, of course. Jairus, one of the leaders of the synagogue. The sick and dying daughter, which is his. And then another woman with some kind of issue. The disciples, the crowds. Presumably, towards the end, the family of the little girl. What we notice are the contrasts being made by the details. Jarius is a religious leader of the synagogue. Someone who knows the law inside and out. Someone who knows what is clean and unclean. Someone who, plain and simple, knows better. Surely he knows where Jesus has come from over in the land of the Gerasenes, walking among the the tombs, interacting with swine and the dead and the outcasts. He'd also know that when Jesus is touched by a ceremonially unclean woman on the way to his house, that now Jesus himself is unclean. Everyone knows the woman, but not for the right reasons. The woman who touches Jesus is not just a a nice part of the story to highlight Jesus' power as we often make her, but rather she represents a contrast to Jairus' position of prestige and power. It's sad she's not given a name. I've often wondered that. Why, Mark, can't you just name this woman? So many women and children and people in our world without a name and issues that have kept them castigated and put aside and and on the margins. Why can't you just name this one woman for me, for us? But then as I think about it, maybe that's the point. Maybe Mark doesn't name this woman because that's part of the detail. It's not always what is written, it's also what is not written that helps us understand the text. Her condition has made her an outcast. It's meant that she could never go to church, so to speak. Could never associate with people in a a social way. Her status and her place in life could not be further opposite than that of Jairus. Perhaps he's even enforced the rules and been one who's kept her from the synagogue. There's even a sense of unspoken blame laid upon her for interrupting Jesus on his way to heal his sick daughter. Oh, he doesn't say it, but man, I know he's thinking it. Even then, the crowd, the people who come up to interrupt his moment say, ah, don't bother him. You can, you can hear it with a, uh, some cynicism and some sarcasm and some anger in their voice or some skepticism or like, yeah, we knew he was a fake anyway. Don't bother the teacher. Then there's another woman in the story, not Jairus' 12-year-old daughter, 
sick, then dead, then only sleeping, and then finally awake. I wish she was named too. But she's not. Again, I wonder if it's because Mark's trying to to draw in the fact that these conditions, these circumstances, these unnamed persons are more common than we like to think. In some ways, she represents the life of the other woman as much as she does her own and the hope that everyone discovers. Both women are healed and restored to their communities. Both women are, are given a voice and a place in society. Don't think that the woman's 12-year issue and the 12-year-old daughter are a mere coincidence. Mark is connecting some dots for us. 12 could represent many things. The the complete number of the tribes of, of Israel signifying that both women are not only daughters of Abraham, but also complete in their healing and full of God's power. It could also be a contrast between 12 years that have surely felt like death and decay for a woman and the 12 years that represent hope and optimism for someone so young. Whatever it is, we could spend a lot of time. I'm not sure that's completely the point. It's part of it. Then there's the crowds, of course. Like most in Mark's Gospel, they represent the unsuspecting masses, yet often hopeful masses who are quick to judge a situation for what it seems to be instead of what it can be, what it might be. They're always pressing, always longing, always searching, but rarely understanding. So the question I have for you today, where do you find yourself in this story? The religious leader? The the woman with an issue for so long? The sick daughter who's died and come to life again? The crowd. The disciples. Where do you find yourself in this story? What are you searching for? What are you longing for and hoping Jesus will take notice of in your life? The crowds are pressing and demanding of Jesus, but I'm, I'm sure they, always, they don't always know what they're seeking. Compare that to the woman, though, who touches Jesus' garment, comes to Him with a purpose. She's desperate by some accounts. But Jesus is quick to teach the crowd a lesson about desperate faith. Not sheer desperation. Have you ever had this kind of faith? A faith that causes you to go where you might not be invited or welcome? A faith that calls or rather pulls you to the center of pressing needs? A faith that cries out from the the margins of life and and seeks and demands restoration. Faith that presses in and presses on. Faith that is persistent even when everything and everyone around you seems to be against you. Part of the miracle in the story isn't the healings that take place, but the faith that persists. Faith of Jairus willing to ask this renegade teacher and boundary-breaking Messiah to his house to heal his daughter. Faith of the woman that simply takes what she believes will heal her and who Jesus commends eventually for it. And of course, let us not forget the faith of Jesus here. That even in the midst of all the madness brings restoration and healing and hope to seemingly dead places once again. Jesus pauses He takes notice. He commends faith. He heals. Now if the story ended with this woman's stolen touch and unnoticed healing and the simple transformation of of her life and and went on to to raise the daughter from the dead, that that would all be enough. That that would be enough of a miracle. We wouldn't think too much about it. We'd get back to the, the main story there. comes forward and tells her story, her truth, the whole truth. Not just what she needed, but what led her to do what she did. Too often we assume we know what people need and why they need it or or why they do what they do. But if this story teaches us anything at all, it teaches us that faith, 
faith that seeks understanding and answers, faith that, faith that seeks to provide hope and healing is faith that takes time to listen, time to understand. When people who are crying out for justice are, are, are doing so, we need to stop and listen. When the voices that have been marginalized for too long are demanding to be heard, we need to stop and listen. When there are cries too deep for words and pain in our world that goes unmitigated, even though we have learned to live with it, we need to stop and listen. So it's not just a question of what we're looking for, what we're searching for. It's also a question for you today. What are you hearing? What are you listening to? We have a lot of work to do together as Christians. We have a lot of work to do as those who have been redeemed by God's love and grace, set forth, set free in the world to share hope. But how often are we so busy getting on our way that we forget about that part of our job, that we forget to do just what Jesus did, to be interrupted, to be stopped, to be challenged right then and there, and to speak up and to ask for the stories and the voices that have been long muffled to be heard. At a recent annual conference in the Methodist Church, Bishop Tracy Malone quoted a poem by Victoria Stafford called Hope that really struck a chord with me. And it's something I think this passage is about, something that, that gives a good definition of the kind of hope we not only claim as Christians, but also the kind of hope we're meant to be sharing with others. Safford writes, Our mission is to plant ourselves at the gates of hope, not the prudent gates of optimism, which are somewhat narrower, nor the stalwart, boring gates of common sense, nor the strident gates of self-righteousness, which creak and shrill on angry hinges. People cannot hear us there. They cannot pass through. Nor the cheerful, flimsy garden gate of everything's going to be all right, but a different sometimes lonely place, the place of truth-telling about our own soul, first of all, and its condition, the place of resistance and defiance, the piece of ground from which you see the world both as it is, as it could be, and as it will be, the place from which you glimpse not only struggle, but joy in the struggle. And we stand there, beckoning and calling, telling people what we're seeing and asking people what they see. In this lesson today, Jesus gave a woman her voice back. He gave a voice back to all who find themselves on the margins, all who have found themselves as outcasts, lost and alone, even in the midst of crowds. He paused long enough to ask her what she saw, why. He stopped in the midst of the struggle, not only because he sensed her pain, but he knew the joy to which she could be restored. We tend to get discouraged by all the work that's before us. We tend to get overwhelmed by the crowds pressing in and pushing on. We just want to get on with our lives, move past the hurts and the pains and the struggles. When a pandemic hits and there's nothing but sickness and isolation and loneliness and death, when racial injustice is laid bare and the inconvenient truth of our prejudices and inequality can no longer be ignored, when natural or human-made disasters strike and waters rise and buildings collapse, these are all opportunities for us to pause, to take notice, to listen, to stand at the gates of hope both the hope that we have and would like to share, but also the hope that can be found by listening and sharing in faith with others. Jesus is on a mission. He's going to help someone who's sick and dying. Time is of the essence, and yet in the midst of the madness, Jesus stops and he notices something, not just something, but someone whose circumstances while living are about as dire as the circumstances he's heading to. He stops and he takes notice. What are you paying attention to these days? What kind of faith do you have? What kind of faith do you long to have? What kind of hope are you sharing? Let us pray. 
Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your word and the powerful stories you tell us. Stories that remind us to slow down, to ask questions, to wake up, pay attention, to ask and seek for what we need, but also to not be in such a hurry that we don't allow others the same opportunity. And so, Lord, bless us this day on our own journeys. Bless this church as it continues to seek vibrancy and mission in the world around. Bless each and every one with opportunity to listen and to share stories of hope and faith and to discover those same stories of hope and faith along the way. Thank you for loving us and inspiring us and filling us full of grace that we can be bearers of hope in this troubled world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us sing, We Come to You for Healing. <laughs> our faith, we say what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Let us come before the triune God as we continue in prayer. Please respond with Lord in your mercy with hear our prayer. God of hope, the ministry of your church extends across borders from nearby neighbors to far and distant countries. Accompany all those who labor eagerly in service of the gospel that through your good news all might experience transformation. Be with our bishop, Elizabeth and Laura. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land that provides our food. Guard all species of plants and animals from harsh changes in climate and empower us to protect all you have made. Lord, in your mercy, Righteous God, we pray for nations and their leaders. Give them a spirit of compassion and steer them towards a fair distribution of resources that none among us would have too much or too little. Be with our troops, protect them, and help them to work for your justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing, your touch has the power to make us whole. We pray for those suffering from physical or mental illness. Embrace those who are sick or in need, those we name aloud or in our hearts. Surround each with your unwavering presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this assembly and all those gathered together in worship. Receive our spirits, renew our relationships, rekindle our faith that we might experience resurrection in this community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful ancestors in every age whose lives have pointed us towards you. Envelop them in your love that we may be reunited with one another in the last days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We want to thank everyone for supporting the ministry of St. Jacob's. would invite you to use the website link if you're following us online or when you go home, uh, electronic giving through Give Plus or mail, or you can drop off your donation. If you are with us in person, you are certainly invited to place your donation in the box following our service at the welcome table. Let us offer thanks for all that God has blessed us with these days. Jesus, bread of life, as we come to this, your table, set this table with your very self, called us to the feasts of plenty, Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us, Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached the good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection and ascension, we await his coming in glory. 
And so we pray, pour out your spirit of love upon us, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. We pray together as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. I got to be honest, I've never done communion quite like this. We got started with it and I realized Jesus was still in my pocket. But maybe that's a metaphor to carry Jesus in our pocket, in our hearts as we go along the way. It's funny, in my ministry career, give communion, I love to give those big chunks. You know that. And now we are doing this because it's what's safer and better. And so I invite you to peel away the very top plastic layer, only the top little plastic layer of the communion cup and access the wafer. I've also never had Jesus blow around quite like he does here. But maybe that's what it's meant to be in the spirit. The body of Christ given for you. Please remove the foil layer. The blood of Christ shed for you. Will you join me in prayer? I know it's not bolded, but if you would say it with me. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In the name we pray. Amen. As we go forth in Christ's name today, Christ invites you to stand at the gates of hope. Be a bearer of love in all that you do. Be gracious in your listening and your doing. Be patient. Be willing to be interrupted by life and those in life along the way. May the God of grace and glory be with you as you do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues. Good Methodist hymn right here, I tell you. to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad, the honors of your name. The name of Jesus charms our fears and bids our sorrow cease. Sings music in the sinner's ears, brings life and health and peace. He speaks and listening to his voice New life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Look unto him, your Savior one, O fallen human race. Look and be saved through faith alone. Be justified by grace. 
Be God of glory, praise and love, be now and ever given. By saints below and saints above, the church in earth and hell. Go in peace. Share the good news. Hallelujah. Be to God. Amen.